You are now tuned into the Black Law Students Association of Canada's YouTube. All right, thank you. Whenever you're ready, appellants. Thank you, Justice. Good morning, Justices. My name is Jacqueline Ebo, J-A-C-Q-U-E-L-I-N-E, -E, last name E-B-O-H. And my co-counsel, Catherine Sinerari, are here today representing Mr. Williams, the appellant. Justices, this case is not only about the right to equality. It is also about the extent to which the government of Canada has an obligation to uphold this right and address systemic barriers that affect the equality of racialized communities, because if not now, then when? Groups that have been historically the targets of discrimination cannot be expected to wait patiently for the protection of their human dignity and equal rights as they die. To that end, the pursuit of justice and equality cannot be colorblind. The appellant, Mr. Jamal Andrew Williams, is at the forefront of this case ensuring, no, fighting, that racialized communities benefit from this right in the same way of those who benefit from whiteness. Canada consistently ranks as one of the best places to live in the world, but this is not the case for all. There are significant socioeconomic disparities and these lead to health disparities. Racialized groups, particularly Canada's black populations have an increased risk of a number of illnesses, poor access to care and worse health outcomes. This case will determine whether the status quo that has been proven to be ineffective to every individual in Canada will remain or if the change needed in a free and democratic society for black people will begin today, starting with the Canadian healthcare system. The appellant respectfully asked this court to find that the Supreme Court of Canada erred in finding that the appellant section seven and 15 charter rights were not infringed. First, the appellant section 15 rights were infringed because of the failure to collect disaggregated race-based data creates a distinction that is discriminatory. Should the court find that this case is about positive and negative obligations, it is a submission of the appellant that the courts are within their purview to impose positive obligations on governments and that costs do not outweigh equality when it comes to race in this country, especially because of the deep historical systemic discrimination ongoing in Canada. Second, the appellant section seven rights were infringed. And third, the infringement of both the appellant section seven and 15 rights cannot be saved under section one of the charter. Would the, would the court care for a brief recitation of the facts? No, thank you, please proceed. Turning to paragraph 41 of the appellant's factum, the appellant submits not collecting disaggregated race-based data infringes on section 15 of the charter because it creates a distinction that is discriminatory on black lives. The collection of race-based data is not about positive or negative obligations on the government. In actuality, it is about the constitutional duty the respondent has to uphold in this country for every single individual. Section 15.1 of the charter states that every individual is equal before and under the law and has the right to equal protection without discrimination based on race, national, ethnic origin, and color. So council, what action that the government is taking is making this differential treatment that you're claiming under? The action that the government is currently taking that constitute distinction and discrimination is the action of collecting disaggregated race-based data on the standard of whiteness. So really it's an argument that they're not Canada doing currently something, rooted. they're not doing enough. Is that correct? Yes, Justice. Okay. Turning to paragraph 41 of the appellant's factum, in the Queen and Cap, the Supreme Court of Canada refined the section 15 analysis originally laid out in law in Canada. This became a two-step legal test. So we're familiar with the test. I'm just gonna ask you then again, which law, so you talked about the disaggregated collection of uh, data, 
uh, which law creates that distinction under the first part of the test? What law are we looking at here? Because you just told me that it's, uh, it's uh, not an, an action that the government is taking, it's a lack of an action that the government is taking. So where, where do we find that law that's creating a distinction? Absolutely, Justice. It is not particularly a law that the government is, is, is doing that is the issue. It's the fact that the government is doing something based on policy and social change and their inaction is creating a distinction that is discriminatory. So in Chow Lee, in uh, paragraph 29, Justice Deschamps quoted, when such social policy, uh, policies infringe rights that are protected by the charters, the courts cannot shy away from considering them. While the decision about the type of healthcare system should adopt falls to the legislator of that province, the resulting legislation, like all laws, is subject to constitutional limits, including those imposed by certain aspects of the so we can haven't you, have Go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. So, I mean, isn't this really a matter for the, for the legislature? Or isn't this beyond the purview of this court? You're asking us to create a law, to step in and create a law. Isn't this something that is best left to the government? Thank you, Justice. The appellant submits that this is not a, this is not go out of the scope of the judiciary because this matter is a matter of justice and affects charter breaches. The fact that they are to charter scrutiny because whiteness is the standard and the benefit provided cannot help the appellant in this case. I proceed, please. Turning to paragraph 42 of the appellant's factum. The appellant submits that the respondent failing to collect such data, as said before, does create a distinction. In Andrews, Justice McIntyre said, and quote, something based on grounds relating to personal characteristics of the individual or group, which has the effect of imposing burdens, obligations, or disadvantages on such individual or group not imposed upon others or which limits access to opportunities, benefits, and advantages available to other members of society. The distinction in this case, as said, as submitted by the appellant is whiteness. Whiteness is a dominant cultural space with enormous political significance with the purpose to keep others on the margin. White people are not required to explain to others how white culture works because white culture is the dominant culture that sets the norms. So, so counsel, I, I get that. We understand that there is a distinction for racialized minorities in Canada, but I'm still failing to see how the relief sought here by the appellant directly connects to those systemic or institutional barriers uh, impacting black populations. What, how, how do you say that a specific aspect of race-based data in the context of COVID-19 is itself responsible for all of the burdens and obligations and disadvantages for Black Canadians in Canada. Justice, is the submission of the appellant that desegregated race-based data is this is a step in order to bring to the forefront discrimination and anti-Black racism that continually perpetuates the issues in, Canadian, in the Canadian healthcare system. Disaggregated race-based data will start, but with cultural competency, having, represented, sorry, having representatives in Black communities, having the data interpreted properly by Black professionals. Collecting disaggregated race-based data is a stepping stone into, such a, into a much bigger issue that needs to be addressed within the Canadian healthcare system. And so if I'm understanding your submissions correctly, then this isn't just uh, the first step, right? Or this is more than just a, a one measure. This is a first step out of a number of measures that you're saying that are necessary. Yes, Justice. And so if the government fails to take any of the subsequent measures in your submission, they would also still be violating the charter. Absolutely, Justice. So what this court is really adjudicating in your submission is more than just the race-based collection of data. It is, a, it is a comprehensive and systemic program intended to root out discrimination in Canadian society. And really, this is just the first step. That's what your submission is. Yes, Justice. And that sounds a lot like legislating from the bench. Would you not agree? The, the appellant does not submit that this sounds like legislating from the bench. The appellant submits that when charter 
infringements are, are, are triggered, it is important for the judiciary to step in to, to protect the Canadian, the healthcare of all Canadians, including Black communities. So although this is a first step into a bigger issue that is systemic, the, it is the job of the judiciary to step in when it comes to infringement of equality. Now, how does this interact with the division of powers? I mean, are we not going to be getting into some sort of problem if, if this court was to find in your favor, um, does that not just create a, a complete storm as between the federal government and the provinces? Is, that, is this something that the federal government can enact when healthcare falls under the purview of the provinces? Justice, it is a submission of the appellant that the COVID-19 pandemic and the collection of disaggregated race-based data falls under the national emergency doctrine. And there are two requirements when it comes for, to issue these emergency powers. There must be a rational basis for the legislation and the leg legislation must be temporary in nature. Now we hope that the COVID-19 pandemic is something that is temporary, but in order for the peace, order and go good government of this country, we believe the appellant submits that this case falls under national, the national emergency doctrine. And in the entire history of Canada, has the Supreme Court of Canada in your submission, uh, there might be authority that I'm unaware of, uh, require the government to do something under this power as opposed to perhaps disallowing them to do something that they were doing? And just to clarify your question, Justice, are you asking if there ha has been a positive obligation required under the national emergency doctrine? Well, I was uh, trying to avoid those specific words because I have read your factum and I understand your argument, but uh, if you want to explain it in that way, that would be fine. Justice, the appellant does not have specific cases in which this was enacted under peace order and good government. But as you said, within the appellant's factum under paragraph 50, there are various amount of cases in which the judiciary has imposed positive obligations on the government. An example being Shader in Canada, where the court held that section 15 of the charter is a hybrid protection, since it is ne neither fully positive or negative, and the government may be required to take positive steps to ensure the equality of people or groups who come within the scope of section 15. Now this did not fall under peace order and good government, but it did fall, the, but the judiciary did impose positive obligations on the government in this case. So in this case though, I mean, under Schachter, it was, um, as I recall, un unemployment insurance benefits. In the subsequent case that you cite in your factum in Eldridge, it's about healthcare services for someone who's hearing impaired. These are all circumstances, as I read them, where the government is providing services already and there's perhaps a deficiency. That's not what you're asking for, as I understand it, right? This is a little bit different. You're asking for them to do something more, more than what they were doing before. Absolutely. And Justice, the, it is the submission of the appellant that the government is providing a benefit. The idea, of collecting the, the idea of collecting data at all to understand how the pandemic is affecting Canadians is in fact a benefit, but it is a discriminatory benefit because they are collecting data based on the idea of whiteness and white privilege, which does not help Black communities in Canada. Where does this fall on the, on the POG test? Which, which branch? Is it peace? Is it order? Is it good governance? What, what, do you, what does the appellant say about that? The, app the appellant submits that this would fall under both peace and order. How? In order, because currently Canada is under, is going through a global and national pandemic. This in essence, there we need peace, sorry. Can the Canadians need peace currently. And in order to get that, the government needs to understand and effectively permit under, understand how to properly help Canadians when it comes to the healthcare system. 
And I mean, is that is that really what peace means in this context? Though, is that not a radical stretching of the meaning of the word peace? W would you agree with me that 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 would be a new a new definition of peace? Yes, Justice, the appellant would submit that this would be a new definition of peace when it comes to peace order and good government. Okay. And I'm going to follow up on your submissions uh, because I think I have found in paragraph 58 the uh, authority that you're using, the Department of Health Act, right? That's what you're saying is the analogous government service or program or authority in which this is operating. And you cite section four sub two B to C in that statute. Is that correct? Yes, Justice. Related to the protection of people in Canada against health and investigation research into public health, including monitoring of diseases. My question for you is why not include the subsection there H, which specifically enumerates a collection analysis, interpretation, publication, and distribution of information related to the public health subject to the Statistics Act. Why have you excluded that specific power under the Act? Thank you, Justice. The reason that we excluded that um, that specific one was to we used we wanted to sorry the appellate wanted to focus on subsection C specifically specifically in response to our friends factum in the idea that the investigation and research into public health, including the monitoring of diseases, is within the purview of the Minister of Health Canada. So it was a response in the um, this going beyond the scope of the federal government because the Minister of Health Canada is a federal agent. So that I understand this is really in some ways then a response to the previous question by my sister justice about the division of powers and, and how this uh, ruling may affect those responsibilities. Is that correct? Yes, Justice. Okay. Turning to paragraph 53 of the appellant's factum. When it comes to considering positive obligations, cost is considered, but equality when it comes to race is a basic human right that cannot be rendered secondary to costs. In Eldridge and British Columbia, financial considerations alone may not justify a section 15 infringement. The respondent cannot use fiscal responsibility as a justification to directly ignore the constitutional rights of black communities. Finally, the appellant submits the infringement of section 15 when pertaining to race, not only should not be saved under section one, but should be excluded from the scope of section one. In a free and democratic society, discrimination is categorically unacceptable. To permit and justify inequality based on race does not only run contrary to the spirit of section 15, but runs contrary to the constitution. Justified, reasonable limits, cannot play a part in systemic racism and the infringement of equality. As Justice Ikebuchi discusses in Vereen, groups that have been historically the targets of discrimination cannot be expected to wait patiently for the protection of their human dignity and equal rights as the government moves towards equality one step at a time. If the infringement of the rights and freedoms of these groups is, permit is permitted to persist, while governments fail to pursue equality diligently, then the guarantees of the charter will be reduced to a little more than empty words. So I'm gonna ask another follow-up then here in terms of applying Vreend in this context. How does the collection, <clears throat> excuse me, of race-based data in, in this context, how does that actually protect human dignity and equal rights? I, I'm still failing to see the connection between collecting information because you're still gonna need additional action beyond the collection of that information, isn't that correct? Absolutely, Justice. And you're presuming what the outcome of that information will be, are you not? The appellant does not submit that, we, that they are presuming what the outcome will be because for any outcome, the beginning is the collection of disaggregated race-based data. There are no further steps that can be taken to either understand how COVID-19 is affecting the black community without the initial step of collecting race-based data. It is like going into surgery without understanding what the issue is and starting to cut. It does not work. We need, the, the appellant is submitting that the Minister of Health Canada needs to understand what is going on before they can address anything going on when it comes to healthcare in the Black community adequately.
But then shouldn't it really be a collection of data that looks at all factors, not just race? I mean, to continue with your analogy, um, you know, cutting into the patient when you don't know what's wrong with them, race is only one factor that goes into why certain communities are disproportionately affected by COVID-19. So doesn't it make more sense to look at all of those factors, the socioeconomic factors, gender, um, you know, not, not just race. Isn't that a better approach? Thank you, Justice. Yeah. Given, get, counsel, given that you're short on time, I want to point you to your fact in a paragraph 45, where you explicitly refer to cultural, religious, linguistic, or other reasons why Black or minority ethnic groups may not benefit uh, and, and may be discriminated as a result. So why, why not have a, a broader capture of the data as uh, suggested from my sister justice? Absolutely, thank you justices. Right now the appellant is focusing on the systemic issue of race in this country, starting from colonialism, going into anti-black racism and understanding medical racism. The intersection and underlying issue in this is race. So although there are other intersecting factors that aren't important, it is important to recognize and address head on the systemic issue of race in this country, starting with this case and the appellant. Justices, in conclusion, it is time to make the change that is much needed in this country. The Black community can no longer be left to fend for themselves in an equal democratic society. The COVID-19 pandemic feeds on and exacerbates existing inequalities. Because of this, Canada's social and health disparities have major implications for the development of evidence-based effective pandemic response. A one-size-fits-all strategy is unlikely to work in a population with diverse needs. Change can never come by accident. It must be intentional, aggressive, and forward thinking, and in accordance with the long held living tree doctrine that informs this country's constitution. If I could be of no further assistance to the court, these are my submissions. Thank you, counsel. Justices, shall I proceed? Yes, please. Thank you. Good morning, Justices. My name for the record is Catherine Sinorari, K-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E-C-I-N-E-R-A-R-I. -E -E I appear on behalf of the appellant, Mr. Jamal Andrew Williams. I will be addressing the issue of section seven and section one. It is the appellant's position that the Supreme Court of Canada erred in determining that Mr. Williams' rights were not violated. As you just heard my co-counsel explain, this case is about equality and the right to life, liberty, and security of the appellant and the Black community of which he is a member. However, this case is more than this. This case is about racial justice, it is about upholding and giving meaning to the very rights that we hold dear as Canadians. And it is about ensuring that those who have historically and continue to be oppressed by institutions receive equal protection under the law. We cannot do this unless we know precisely where inequality exists. And thus we must require the respondent to collect disaggregated race-based data. Today, I'll be making the following submissions. First, the decision to not collect race-based data is not political in nature, but rather a matter of justice that calls for the imposition of positive obligations on the respondent. Second, I will address the Section 7 analysis, specifically that all three protected interests are all infringed and that this deprivation is not in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. And third, I will address the issue regarding the concerns about surveillance and the misuse of data 
as well as the charter failing in its protection of minority and group rights. So council, before you jump into those, I'm gonna direct you please to paragraph 47 of your factum. I'm looking for some clarification here. Absolutely, Justice. And so in this context, you're referring to the Anti-Racism Act and the fact that under that statute, there is the collection of race-based data, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. Um, the Anti-Racism Act, as I recall, is a provincial statute, is it not? That is correct, Justice. Uh, the reason why we highlight this particular act is to demonstrate that there is a need for the, to, for the um, government to take action. And now it is the appellant's submission that it has to be applied on the government level as well. So, so the last sentence there saying that the federal government's uh, failure, if you will, to collect race-based data is in direct contravention of the Anti-Racism Act. You're not suggesting that the provincial government's legislation is binding on the federal government, are you? No, that is not what we are suggesting there. Okay. Turning to my first submission, which is found at paragraph 19 of the appellant's factum, the appellant submits that the disproportionate impact that the COVID-19 pandemic has had on him is a matter of racial injustice and is not a political decision that is ultra virus of this honorable court. This is supported by Justice Lemaire in reference re section 94.2 of the Motor Vehicle Act, where he held that, quote, the courts are empowered, indeed required, to measure the content of legislation against the guarantees of the Constitution, end quote. The Supreme Court in the same decision also articulated- Council, I'm gonna stop you there. Again, that's the content of legislation. We, we don't, we have that absence here. And that's, I think, one of our, one of our problems. This, this is asking us to do something in, in the absence of that bucket full of legislation. Where are we to look? Thank you, Justice. Um, it's the appellant's position that according to the Department of Health Act, there is legislation that does require uh, the appellant, or sorry, the respondent to act, and that by collecting data in the first place under a standard of whiteness does fail to uh, comply with the Constitution. You keep referring to the standard of whiteness. Um, where can can you explain that to me? Uh, where is that found in the in the legislation? What is the what is the basis for that position? It's the appellant's position that the collection of race based sorry the collection of health data as currently structured, um, according to uh, for example frontline workers or employment status, according to age according to health conditions that related to COVID without looking at the way race impacts and influences those variables, there's a gap of information that is missing that does uh, violate the appellant's rights. Because that standard presumes that everyone is treated equally and that is not the position of the appellant. Well, uh, in the, at the same time though, <clears throat> we, we, we concede that or, or acknowledge that there's a disproportionate number of black Canadians who are COVID positive. And so to the extent that we're collecting information generally about COVID-19 cases, there would be a, an inflated proportion of black Canadians in that data set, wouldn't there? Absolutely, Justice. Um, How is the standard of whiteness then being applied if there's a data set where there's a disproportionate number of black Canadians already in that data set? Because, Justice, the, the issue is that, that data doesn't contextually analyze the way race plays a role in those. So the fact that racialized and Black communities represent the majority of those in low income or frontline essential workers, that's left out of the data. What I'm hearing then is that it's really perhaps an intersectional element that includes things like low income that may be informing the situation of COVID and that race may not in itself be determinative in any way. It's the opponent's position, Justice, that race is one factor. Absolutely, there are other social determinants of health. So for example, income, uh, type of employment, uh, environmental conditions, those all play a factor. But when you look at the statistics and you ignore the way in which race is implicated, that's where the issue lies. Isn't there a danger though, if, you know, if, if we grant the relief you're seeking, we're gonna be here next week um, with um, lawyers from LEAF um, and other, other organizations saying the government is you know, infringing our charter rights because they aren't collecting data on women. They aren't collecting data 
on, you know, based on socioeconomic factors. Again, you know, isn't this again really a matter for the legislature to address head on because there are so many interests at stake and it is dangerous for a court to weigh in and piecemeal it out. Isn't there a real danger there? Thank you, Justice. Um, so the appellant's position is that this decision will actually benefit all members. The, 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 if the relief is granted, the benefits will flow to all communities. And moreover, um, when you look at all the statistics, it, it is the issue of race and it's racialized individuals and black individuals and communities specifically that are disproportionately affected. So while the concerns of women, which by the way, the statistics are gathered according to gender and they are gathered according to income. So what they're not gathered according to is race. And while it is, you know, within the purview of the legislator to make decisions, it is also within the purview of the courts to make sure that those decisions are constitutionally compliant. Um, to support this, um, Justice Arbor in dissent in Gosling articulated that the rules of courts are as interpreters of the charter and guardians of its fundamental uh, freedoms and le against legislative or administrative infringements. This is also supported in Canada, Attorney General and PHS, where when policy is translated into law, and although we do concede that there is no specific law that calls for race-based data, there is support that uh, the actions and the effects of what is being currently produced through policy of collection of the data, these are subject to car uh, charter scrutiny. Um, and as I will discuss in my second submission, the case, this case does trigger Section 7 and therefore does fall within the purview of the courts. Um, with respect to the question of positive rights, as my co-counsel has already articulated, there is ample room for this in the Charter for this Honourable Court to interpret Section 7 in a way that does uh, impose positive obligations. Uh, Chief Justice McLaughlin in Gosselin uh, held that Section 7 may be interpreted to include positive obligations. In Blanco, uh, the Supreme Court held that courts should be aware of the need to safeguard a degree of flexibility and in the interpretation and the evolution of Section 7. Certainly, the, I mean, to breathe life. counsel like Gosselin spoke to the possibility, but I mean, the very next paragraph there uh, by uh, Justice McLaughlin at that time, uh, as she was then, um, says that the facts on that specific case did not warrant it. And I, so I think the question here is, why are the facts in this case more compelling than they were in Glossolet? Respectfully to Justice McLaughlin and, and the Supreme Court at that time, their analysis failed to consider the intersectionality that we are asking for here. So their analysis focused solely on the complainant, but it failed to consider the way in which socioeconomic status, gender, and poverty all interplayed to prevent her from accessing those particular services. In a way, they almost um, blamed the individual for not taking full benefit of the system, but the system in and of itself wasn't uh, conducive to those intersectional needs. This case is uh, distinguished because of that, is that there are intersectional issues at play, such as the social determinants of health, and that needs to be addressed in this decision. So to breathe life into section seven, a reading of positive obligations is necessary. This is especially true in times of crisis. It is these moments in our nation's history that call for the re-examination of how these rights are to be interpreted. Doing so oh, is counsel, a fact- I'm gonna stop you right there because you're, you're presenting your argument from a position that the collection of race-based data um, is a necessary step in the fight against systemic racism. But how would you respond to the argument that actually race-based data can be harmful um, and is actually detrimental? Um, as I under understand it, that's one of the arguments against your position. So I'd like you to address that. Absolute justice. Um, it, it is the appellant's position that the potential of harm cannot outweigh or dissuade the need for the data. Uh, when the data is collected in consultation with the community, when it is interpreted and disseminated by the Black community, it is the, the appellant's position that it will mitigate any potential risk for misuse. Further, any potential misuse will still be subject to constitutional scrutiny. 
So turning to the appellant's section seven analysis, which is found at paragraph 24 of the appellant's factum, the appellant submits that the failure to collect the data violates all three interests under section seven. Section seven of the charter uh, protects everyone's right to life, liberty, and security of the person, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. A two-step analysis is used in order to determine whether a Section 7 violation has occurred. First, there is an identification of the interest in question, and then a determination whether that protected interest is infringed. And then second, there must be a determination whether the infringement is in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice. This requires an identification of the relevant principle, and then whether that protected infringe, the protected interest the infringement of which occurred in accordance with said principle. So, Council, now... the time I'm going to help move you along. I, I think we're we're pretty familiar with the test. Um, I'm interested in how the right to liberty is engaged in this context. Number one. Number two. I'm very interested because that's the essential component in section seven as to how the principles of fundamental justice are engaged and how they're violated in this context for any of those uh, three that you listed. Absolutely, Justice. Uh, so the right to liberty is engaged as there has been a deprivation of personal autonomy that goes to the core of Mr. Williams' individual dignity. The appellant submits that- Sorry, without... sorry we, we need to slow this down a little bit. The okay, failure okay. to collect race-based data has impacted on his liberty rights? That is correct because- uh, So what the appellant submits is that without the data, the healthcare system rela remains largely predicated on a standard of whiteness that limits the course of medical treatment available to him. This results in medical professionals being ill-equipped to diagnose patients of color and understand the ways in which various symptoms of COVID appear. So for example- But is there is there a different way? Is there a different test that is to be used for people of different races for COVID? Is that what you're saying? No, what we're saying is that with this data, it will hopefully uh, be the catalyst in, in uh, combating anti-Black racism. Like I was saying, for example, um, one of the symptoms related to COVID is blue skin discoloration or red rashes. This appears differently than it does on white skin and dark, darker complexions. Without this data to acknowledge the inherent biases within the medical profession, the appellant's individual dignity is um, infringed because he has no choice in medical treatment if they're not diagnosing him accurately. So I'm still not seeing how that affects liberty interest only because uh, I'm thinking of the uh, Section 7 uh, liberty interest cases that I'm familiar with, like uh, Valiancourt and Swain and Winko, uh, Demers, uh, and I can go on, where they typically involve factual context like a physical restraint or some sort of imprisonment or even the threat of imprisonment. I, I, I fail to see facts here, at least uh, maybe I'm, I'm missing it, to, to understand how the right to liberty component of Section 7 is engaged in this context. Justice, the, the, the cases that you cited are one aspect of liberty. An additional interpretation of liberty, um, as cited in, and my apologies for the pr pronunciation, French is not a language that I speak fluently, uh, Gobo and Longio, at paragraph 66, the court articulated that liberty has been interpreted to mean protection from phys physical restraint or deprivation from personal autonomy that goes to the core of what it means to be an individual, sorry, to what core of what it means to enjoy individual dignity uh, and independence. So the individual dignity here in question is the right to choose medical treatment. That cannot be done if doctors are not equipped to diagnose uh, black and racialized individuals. Well, in, in God Boot, which is how I pronounce it, sorry. Okay, I think it, it involved a right to privacy for a municipality that was adopting a resolution for all the employees who were within a specific boundary and whether or not the home fell within that specific boundary. I, I just don't see the analogy here about how that case, again, applies in this context. And, and I'm just going to suggest that to the extent that you may be stumped, uh, really the the principles of fundamental justice here is still the essential component that needs to be made, even if the other two elements of this section are made. So, you know, I would invite you to make your submissions where you think uh, they may be most effective. Absolutely. Um, with respect to Gabu, um, you, you are correct, Justice. That was a, a matter of imposing residence. Um, but the key issue was that it was the, the right to make the decision on where to live. 
and that goes to the choice of personal autonomy. Similarly, it's the right to medical treatment and make informed decisions about how an individual can um, exercise the right to have access Council, to medical care. In the example you gave, I mean, there are, there are a variety of symptoms here uh, for, for COVID. Um, and so the fact that one of the symptoms uh, may not be applicable to your client doesn't mean that he's not, um, he wouldn't be diagnosed with all of the other uh, symptoms, right? I mean, there's, you know, so you've given one example, but again, I don't see how it engages the um, the liberty aspect of, of Section of 7. So, you know, you've, you've, you've kind of chosen one convenient one, but but what about all the other ones? Doesn't that take care of it? Justice. Doesn't that provide the autonomy and the, and the dignity? Justice, thank you. Um, although skin discoloration may be uh, one symptom, there is still the implicit racial, racial bias in the medical profession that discredits, distrusts, and frankly doesn't believe Black patients when they come seeking medical treatment, whether it's with respect to pain or they may be perceived as individuals seeking drugs. And that is also another issue. So that in combination with the other uh, symptoms could leave the appellant without having any identification of that. What's being presented as COVID is being misdiagnosed as bronchitis or, you know, asthma or simply anxiety. Well, I mean, that may have been true perhaps a year ago, counsel, but I mean, I think it's pretty standard course at this point to do a COVID test for every patient who's displaying any kind of COVID symptoms. So I still don't see how those types of um, perhaps misapprehensions about uh, what a, a patient might be facing applies in this context because they would still be receiving a, a COVID nasal swab test. The, co the coloration of their skin would be irrelevant in this context. Justice, respectfully, that's the assumption that the doctor presumes that these are COVID symptoms. If the racial bias could be that the individual is just seeking drugs, and in that case, the doctor wouldn't present or present or propose a COVID test. If I could, though, I would like to turn to the issue of the principles of fundamental justice that you had uh, mentioned earlier. Um, so the case of Malmo Levine articulated a test that's found at paragraph 31 of our factum. Uh, I would like to point to the court to the third step of the analysis, which is uh, defining with sufficient precision to use a manageable result. Um, it is the appellant's position that equality is to be interpreted as a principle of fundamental justice, and it does meet this test for two reasons. Equality is entrenched in the charter, the grounds of which are set out in section seven, and the parameters and scope of equality claims are sufficiently known. And secondly, if this honorable court continues with the judicial trend of interpreting equality to mean substantive equality, as seen as Andrews and Alliance, and incorporates an intersectional analysis within the Section 7 framework, a sufficient definition of equality can be discerned. An intersectional analysis includes acknowledging the various configurations or sites of oppression because of an, of an individual's identity markers that can influence one another. The lack of consistency amongst judges to contextually consider the Section 7 claims of marginalized claimants reveals the need for structural change to Section 7. It is this court's role now to solidify this trend and bring meaning to the right that has been for so long ignored and underutilized. Turning to the appellant's first theoretical argument under Section 7, found in paragraph 36 of the appellant's factum, the appellant submits that although there are legitimate concerns regarding the implications on the use of this data, such as over surveillance or distrust towards the government, this concern cannot overpower the need for it. The data will be a catalyst in combating anti-Black racism in the healthcare, and by eliminating the availability of the data rather than regulating and controlling its use, will continue the erasure of medical racism that the appellant faces. Further, the allegation that the misuse will still be subject to all available, oh, sorry, the allegation of misuse lacks merit because it will still be subject to all available constitutional challenges. It is the appellant's position that a fear of potential cannot dissuade from taking action when the reality is um, the health of the black community is in jeopardy. 
And turning to the next theoretical argument under Section 7, found at paragraph 39 of the Appellant's Factum, the Appellant submits that Section 7 has been interpreted in a particular manner that is focused on an individualistic notion of rights predicated on westernized version of liberalism. This version presumes individuals are self-interested, detached from their community, and presumes the universality of rights, the applicability of which will protect everyone equally. This is incorrect. By reframing the Charter, specifically Section 7, to include group rights, this court has the opportunity to expand rights for those most marginalized while still adhering to the liberal interpretation of Section 7. Um, I would now like to turn to the court's attention the matter of Section 1, found in paragraph 56 of the Appellant's Factum. It must be noted that although the determination whether an infringement uh, can be saved under Section 1 is to be established by the respondent, the Appellant submits that the infringement of Mr. Williams' rights cannot be saved under Section 1 for the following reasons. Firstly, there is no rational connection between the respondent's failure to collect this data and its, and its objective to protect the health of Canadians um, when the Black community is disproportionately affected by COVID. Justices, I see that my time is up. Um, I will rely on the remainder of my factum for my submissions. May I please have a moment to conclude? Yes, please. Thank you. Justices, today's actions will set the course for tomorrow's rights. In order to make, pro make the promise of justice under law, this court must consider the ways in which the respondent has failed to protect the health of the appellant in its decision to not collect race-based data. As such, this court must find that the appellant section seven and 15 rights were violated and that the Supreme Court erred in their decision that they were not. The rights protected by section seven and 15 have become embedded into the very DNA of Canadian identity. Nothing can weaken this DNA more so than failing to protect and assert those rights. It is therefore incumbent on this court to ensure that the law as currently formulated does not continue to be a tool of oppression. Justices, this decision has the opportunity to shape and set out principles that will guide the future of Section 7 litigation. If there are no further questions, these are my submissions. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Uh, Council for the respondents, are you uh, ready? Yes, Justice. And to our timer, we're going to um, split our time down the middle, so 22 and a half minutes each. Thank you. Good morning, Justices. My name is Madison Schmidt, and we have with us my co-counsel, Keisha Holloman Dawson. The format of our submissions today is a little different than our friends. First, I will make four doctrinal submissions. You will then hear from my co-counsel who will present three theoretical submissions. First, I will begin with the threshold issue that the charter does not apply to these facts. My second submission will be that the forced collection of race-based data does not infringe the section seven rights of life, liberty, or security of the person. My third submission will be that the minister's decision also does not infringe the section 15 right to equality. Finally, my fourth submission will be that if an infringement is found by this court, such infringement is justified under section one of the charter. We are here today because the appellant seeks to impose a positive obligation on the minister to make the decision that Mr. Williams wants the minister to make. Respectfully, it would be a dangerous implication if the minister or any other government decision maker could be taken to court when they make an informed decision that someone doesn't like. Okay, Council, in, in the interest of time, given that you have four different submissions, I want to take you directly to paragraph seven. The second sentence in that paragraph, sorry, in that uh, in your factum, uh, says that the charter applies to all legislation and actions made by the federal government. Does the charter only apply to the federal government or can it apply to other parties within our uh, legal system as well? To government actors as well as those parties uh, uh, acting under government authority. So it can also apply to the provincial government as well? Yes. Okay. I was just confused by that specific sentence uh, in terms of the way that it was phrased. Okay, please proceed. My apologies, Justice. 
So further on that, on my first submission at paragraph seven of our factum, as a threshold matter, we submit that the charter does not apply to these circumstances. While the charter applies to legislation and any actions taken by the government, we have neither in this case. So what would your response be to the appellant's submission that the Department of Health Act is the impugned legislation in this instance? The respondent does not view this as a decision made under the enabling legislation. We would take the view as the majority of the Supreme Court did that this is rather an omission by the minister rather than an action under that legislation. Well, I mean, the legislation, especially the paragraphs that they focus to, do talk about the collection of information and investigation about public health issues, right? So the manner in which that legislation is applied, does that not also attract charter scrutiny? The manner that the legislation is applied would, Justice, yes. But the decision that we have in this case is one of the day-to-day -day operations of the minister. And if every decision that a government agency made on a day-to-day -day basis were challenged in court, the system would become unworkable. There has been some- Isn't that a somewhat convenient argument for, for the government to make? Um, because it effectively says, oh, we're not doing anything, so it's not subject to the charter. Um, and isn't that the whole point of the charter to ensure that the living tree grows, um, that systemic racism is rooted out? Um, and wouldn't a decision that affirms that position really be detrimental to the development of this, of this country? I don't believe so, Justice, because if we look at the case law um, in which um, the Supreme Court has, has made determinations based on what they would consider omissions in, in legislation, um, where they haven't actually ruled on a complete inaction by the government, but if we look at the cases where they um, do discuss omissions, that the stakes in those cases are much lower than the stakes that we have today, and that we are currently experiencing extraordinary an extraordinary emergency. But if the stakes are higher here, shouldn't this court act? It would not be our submission, as we do believe that the minister is acting in the interests of racial racial justice, and that there's there's no evidence that there has been infr an infringement of charter rights in this case. So this court would not be doing um, Canadians an injustice by choosing not to act in this case. If we look at Vreend in Alberta specifically, they were handling the Individuals Rights Protection Act. And that legislation was being brought for failing to include sexual orientation as one of its explicitly protected groups. It was the inclusion of some protected groups in contrast to the intentional omission of others that led the Supreme Court to rule that the charter applied. As you mentioned to my friends, Justice Martin, this, in this case, the appellant hasn't put forward any legislation in relation to this specific decision other than the ena enabling legislation. Additionally, the court in Breen specifically declined to make a determination of whether the charter would apply to a complete lack of action. As the court decided not to uh, determine that issue in these ca that case, we would submit that the court should not uh, make a determ that determination here, as again, the, the stakes are much higher. But hasn't, I mean, Breen, Breen was, you know, one of the early charter cases we're 35 almost years on from Breen. Hasn't, haven't we developed? Shouldn't, shouldn't we be moving on, really growing? Isn't it detrimental again to always say, well, this is how it was done 30 years ago, so this is how we're going to do it. Isn't it time for change? Haven't Black Canadians waited long enough? Of course, the Charter is a living tree, and we do... Um we wouldn't submit that the court should always make the same findings. And of course, the Diversity High Court of Canada does have these interests in mind. However, again, with this specific lack of action that we're dealing with here, a system that would challenge the government every time a decision such as this is made would simply become unworkable. Well, counsel, I don't think the argument here is that it's every time that a government makes a decision. And uh, the appellants in paragraph 51 of their factum, uh, point of reen, but they also point to Big M and they point to uh, Delisle to cite authorities that there are situations where in order to make a fundamental meaning, fundamental freedom meaningful, that restraint will not be enough, that you need to have positive governmental action and that that positive governmental action uh, would in fact be warranted in exceptional circumstances. Their argument is 
these are those exceptional circumstances. And so I don't know if that's what their argument is, that we're going to be doing this every day uh, on any type of charter issue. They're saying these are exceptional issues. These are exceptional circumstances. It won't open up the floodgates because we're just looking at this as a discrete action and a discrete issue to address Black Canadians during a very, very special time and vulnerable time in our in our situation in Canadian history. And building on that, isn't the floodgates argument always put forward by the government on these issues? Is isn't? I mean, we've heard that before. So again, you know, I I, I just follow up my brother's uh, my brother judges question with with that with that point. Yes, it would not be our submission that the charter should never apply like to uh, to inaction by the government. But in these circumstances in particular, where the minister is handling a situation wherein there are many, many interests at play, and the minister has the expertise and the additional information required to make the best decision, uh, given those interests, um, it's, it's not in the best interests of Canadians for the court to, in, uh, to inject itself and make a determination based on this one aspect uh, where the minister has many other interests to balance. So I, generally, I would agree with you in terms of the arguments about judicial restraint, but do, do you not think that there's perhaps room for less restraint when there are interests of a vulnerable uh, minority uh, population that has an extensive history of being uh, discriminated in Canadian society and in particular within the healthcare system? Isn't that uh, a situation where the court perhaps should be less restrained? Potentially, but again, the minister has an extended expertise on these matters. It is not only the interests of racial minorities that the minister must contend with, but the, the health and safety of every Canadian, regardless of their membership in enumerated groups. Well, the minister probably doesn't have, I mean, has, you're saying has the expertise as it relates to public health, right? But probably does not uh, claim to have expertise as it relates to racial justice. I think that's the argument that I was hearing from the appellants in this case. Correct. But it, it would be our submission that while that is not, racial justice is certainly not um, one of the enumerated grounds that the minister um, is responsible for, it was part of the consideration that the minister took into account in making this determination that that information, if improperly collected and improperly used, uh, could result in actions that would cause more harm than benefit. But isn't the corollary of that, if properly used, if we focus on that side of things could be beneficial not just to 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 persons of color but also to all Canadians I mean given the nature of the way this this virus spreads um, and the way in which it's going to be treated isn't it isn't it a better idea to look at the positive benefits that you could you know serve public health of all Canadians fight this you know discrimination and get a better understanding of you know how how Black Canadians are treated by the healthcare system, isn't it? Isn't it that a more compelling argument than, oh, some people might misuse this? And I mean, what? How do you address the appellant's arguments that if it is misused, there are remedies for that? Yes, um, it would be the the appellant or the respondent submission that um, if this information were collected, there there really isn't as much benefit as we might imagine in having that information. Um, in that the way that we respond to COVID, what the best practices are, namely washing your hands, wearing a mask, social distancing, all of those best practices and our ability to protect the health of Canadians, all of those would remain the same. And so this information would not provide us with, um, with, with increased benefits that, that we might imagine. So for white Canadians, there's not a benefit. But for, what for about any, black Canadians? So for, for instance, if we were to collect this information and it did find that there was an increased risk um, for black Canadians, the respondent doesn't believe that those members uh, of society would be able to take any different actions. The ultimate action that we can take right now to protect ourselves from COVID is to stay home. And if you're already unable to, to make that, dis, that decision for your health without the information, then, then having that information isn't going to make that decision any easier. But would it, would it not have an impact on the way in which the government responds to the program or to the problem and the way in which the government helps certain communities? Isn't, isn't that what, what 
the hope the data is used for so that the government can make informed decisions. Um, and, and that's that's where the benefit could really be. We don't believe that it would. The minister is already doing everything within its power to protect the health of Canadians, and that information wouldn't provide the minister with any additional avenues um, to protect the to protect Canadians' health any more than it currently is. I would now move to my second submission and direct the court to paragraph ten of our factum. The minister submits that the appellant's right to life liberty and security of the person under section seven of the charter was correctly determined by the Supreme Court to not have been infringed. The right to life has not been infringed as the minister's choice about data has not caused death or even a serious risk of death. The COVID-19 pandemic threatens the lives of all Canadians and providing medical care and preventing the deaths of Canadians are the minister's top priority. In PHS Community Services Society in Canada, the court determined that the closure of a safe injection site was a violation of the right to life because it took away life-saving treatment from people who needed it. But in this case, medical care is still being provided to the highest standards possible. The right to liberty has also not been infringed, as the minister has not impacted the appellant's autonomy nor imprisoned him. The, the ability of Black Canadians to make decisions about their health, which are fundamental personal decisions and part of the liberty rights, has not been impacted. With or without the data, the best practices remain the same. And, and those best practices are the things that every Canadian should be doing. While our friends submit at paragraph 28 of their factum that, quote, the appellant is prevented from being able to exercise his right to personal autonomy and dignity, end quote, the minister submits that the appellant and other Black Canadians are still free to make these choices along with every other Canadian. Therefore, the right to liberty has not been infringed. But isn't the problem that they're not treated, or maybe, and this gets into the sameness argument um, that was discussed in Andrews, um, and I mean, that, that's been addressed by the Supreme Court. So is that the argument that you're that you're making that they're treated the same as everybody else and they've got the same options and doesn't that really ignore the historic racism and mistreatment by the medical system so they they are not in the same position as every canadian so could you address the sameness argument um and help me understand what why that doesn't why that doesn't or does apply to this case Certainly under the section 15, right, we are looking at substantive equality and uh, same treatment is, is not enough to achieve substantive equality. But when we're looking under section seven at the um, right to liberty, um, it is really about the ability to make choices when we're, when we're talking about the fundamental personal decisions that are um, protected by the right to liberty. And, and those decisions are still being able to be made and um, would not would not change. We would submit with the additional information. I would move to the principles of fundamental justice under Section Seven. It is submitted that the objective of the minister's action or inaction in this case was to put the health of Canadians first while balancing many interests particularly without infringing the right to privacy or overburdening the healthcare system in a time of crisis. The decision as the purpose is directly connected to the result in that the minister made the decision which most effectively balanced all interests by deciding to provide top tier healthcare, but not to add data collection to the plates of healthcare workers during unprecedented times. The decision is not overbroad because its impact is narrow in relation to its objective. The only impact that that specific data does is that that data does not exist. The healthcare system and the health of Canadians is not otherwise affected. The decision was also not grossly disproportionate as it is consistent with the genuine government interest of being able to weigh all of the relevant interests and expert opinions necessary in unprecedented times without causing strain on an already traumatized system. In summary on the issue of the section seven infringement, it is submitted that the right to life, liberty, and security of the person has not been infringed. If there is a breach, such breach is consistent with the principles of fund fundamental justice and thus not an infringement of section seven. I will now begin my third submission and direct the court to paragraph 20 of our factum. 
the Supreme Court was correct in finding that the Section 7 or Section 15 right to equality had not been infringed. The minister submits that the decision not to collect disaggregated race-based data does not make a distinction in purpose or effect based on an enumerated ground. The appellant claims that a distinction has been made based on race, but no substantive difference in treatment has arisen. While it is true that identical treatment is not enough to achieve substantive equality, it is submitted that no disproportionate impact has resulted and the decision based on the, uh, from the decision based on the appellant's identity as a Black Canadian. Well, counsel, I think the argument here might be that there is a disproportionate number of Black Canadians who have COVID-19. And Potentially. The, the, well, no, we know that there is. We know that there is a disproportionate number of Canadians who have COVID-19. That's, that's, I think, a, a fact on the record. I, I, the bigger question would be, does the collection then of race-based data help inform treatment and uh, responses to that fact? And the respondent's submission would be that it doesn't. We would say that the Supreme Court correctly noted at paragraph five of their decision in this case that the collection of race-based data may not even improve public health from the standpoint of racial disparities. The minister submits that had we collected such data, it could have been used to perpetuate racism by reinforcing the prejudicial assumptions that some people hold against Black Canadians. Rather, the minister's decision prevented the further perpetuation of disadvantage by not adding to the burden or increasing the historical gap between Black Canadians and the rest of society. If we look at the case of Whiffler in Canada, the government decision at issue in the Section 15 claim was part of a larger social benefit program related to death benefits. And the court noted that the fact that the decision was required to balance many interests was a relevant factor in the Section 15 analysis. The situation is the same in this case. It should be taken into account that the minister is in the position position of balancing a myriad of interests in making these decisions that impact the healthcare system at large. The minister is in the best position to make these decisions in a manner that does not perpetuate prejudice and also achieves the minister's other goals. The minister submits- does the minister, does the minister deny that there is a problem with the discrimination in the healthcare system? No, the minister recognizes that uh, medical racism is very much an issue that we deal with. Okay, so so then, you know, I think the hope or the, the purpose, again, of collecting the race-based data is to, is to address that, really. And so if the minister is always going to fall back on this argument that, well, it's, it's, gonna, it's just going to perpetuate, it's going to make racism worse, um, isn't that a little bit too convenient? Um, I mean, again, at what point should this court step in and say, no, we, we believe the time is now. Um, we believe that this data should be collected so that, that that problem can be addressed because the minister, although recognizing that there's a problem, is not doing anything about it. And I think that is the concern and the experience of Mr. Williams. So is it the time now? Certainly, um, I think the issue that we need to keep in mind in this case is that the information that the appellant is requesting, which is simply just race-based data, would not allow us to make to make an informed response. We would need a much broader and much more detailed uh, data collection and analysis process than simply collecting information re regarding race. Um, as has been mentioned, there's, there's many other factors that play into social determinants for health and, and what is actually happening in, in Canada right now. And so collecting this inf the race-based information alone uh, would, would leave the picture incomplete and leave us making an improper response. And as I only have one minute remaining, I would direct the court to our factum for our section one submissions and make my concluding remarks. In conclusion, the respondent submits that the charter cannot apply to force the minister to make a particular decision, especially in emergency circumstances where the decision must be made quickly and balance a myriad of interests. We submit that the appellant's section seven and 15 rights have not been infringed. If the court determines that they have been, then section one should apply to protect the minister's decision as being prescribed by law and justified in a free and democratic society. Subject to any questions, those are my submissions.
Thank you, Council. Thank you. Good afternoon, Justices. Uh, as my co-counsel mentioned, I will be discussing the theoretical arguments as they pertain to this case and reevaluating with a lens of critical race theory the principles of deference, specifically as it relates to discretion and the positive administration of racial justice. State inaction, which should consider legislative reasoning, such as contrary effects and negative implications, if it is to enforce positive obligations on the minister in emergency circumstances, and paternalism, among other effects of its own action on vulnerable groups. I would like to first start off by saying that, that critical race theory does not prescribe one particular answer to the question of whether race-based data collection should happen. It simply asks us to look at, how the, at the process through a racial lens. Race-based data collection may seem more favorable, but we must examine how even this approach can play, play and have a detrimental effect on the advancement of racial justice. With regards to deference, our friends infer and suggest that the approach of not collecting race-based data is not race, con race conscious, but colorblind. We must consider the uniqueness of the time and each individual because treating an entire group alike without taking into consideration lived experience does not counter racism in the law, it perpetuates it. Racialized Canadians cannot be placed into neat packages without also analyzing the interconnection of multiple factors. Lived experience is different for everyone and this data will not necessarily represent what people need. Well, council, council, we're, we're accustomed to seeing deference from the perspective of, you know, deference of the judiciary, if you will, to the legislature and or to the minister in this case. But isn't there in a critical race theory analysis room for an argument of deference to the racialized, uh, more specifically, the black applicant who is saying this type of measure will not only benefit me, but it will benefit members of our community. There's an element of deference in that respect, too, is there not? Absolutely, and what we're submitting is that a nuanced approach should be taken when advancing and evaluating deference as a whole. That it should consider whether the minister or legislature is taking into consideration or could possibly have taken this into consideration. And balancing not just between the interests of people, but also um, what the effects might be on a singular group of people as well. So balancing the, the positive effects of their inaction or action, as well as the negative implications. And to defer to them if, if necessary in that case. Um, all right. the, the principle of deference asks us to defer to the legislature in matters that the court is ill-informed to handle. Our submission, again, is to take a nuanced approach. Deference with a critical race theory lens emphasizes the importance of considering the lack of expertise that the, the court has and how it will impact the affected individual or group. A lack of relevant Canadian resources in a pandemic, which is already risk averse, demanding and urgent, uh, suggests that the principle of deference should be adhered to in order to protect not only each Canadian, but the ones who are most severely impacted by it. As you mentioned, the data suggests that Black Canadians are the most at risk. So by doing what is most important and best practice to protect all Canadians, they are protecting Black Canadians as well. So your, your suggestion is that we should assume that the minister and that government and legislative authority will implicitly protect Black Canadians because that's just what they're going to do. Not necessarily. The system at a whole, as a whole uh, it, there is racism in, in the system. It's just that in this case, it's about balancing the possible negative implications as well. Um, one of those such considerations is understanding that the negative implications of poor, uh, poor collection also comes into play here. And in an emergency situation, the, the best practices are going to do the most benefit for the vulnerable groups. Okay, of course. So let's, let's talk a little bit about some of those best practices, and I'm going to take you to paragraphs 34 and 35 of your factum, uh, where you correctly acknowledge that and, and submit that racial uh, identification and distinctions are, are social constructs, not biological constructs. 
Uh, but then you say that these constructs are not useful. Uh, and that in your submission of deference that we shouldn't be just balancing these different rights um, and, and instead you know, should analyze whether deference to the authorities aligns with the courts aim to protect minority rights. I'm having difficulty understanding this because yes, race is a social construct, but it's a real social construct in the sense that it is actively used in Canadian society to discriminate against people. So why should the court not be scrutinizing this? I'm sorry, I should clarify. Um, that's race alone is not a useful construct. This, I say this because there's implications in that in, it, in and of itself. Um, okay, so then I, if, if you're, if I, I'm understanding then the intersectional argument, why not then collect race as well as other elements as well? There, is there anything wrong with that? Would that be uh, okay with the minister from, from your perspective? Uh, I, I can't make that decision myself, but what we're given, submitting given, is that- the, Given the, the, the unique rules of this court, okay, I think we, it's within our uh, jurisdiction to make an argument that is broader. And in fact, the appellants have actually suggested that, that this is just a first step. And if we're gonna do a first step, why not have a multifactorial uh, uh, collection of data that includes race, but also other aspects so that we can better understand the situation that we're in in the pandemic. That would address, I think, the submissions of the appellant, but also the objections that you've raised here in paragraphs 34 and 35 of your factum. Yes, okay. Um, you had mentioned a comprehensive program and that, that might entail cer certain things. Our friends uh, suggested that that would entail community involvement. Um, there, there would be a multitude of factors analyzed in that kind of decision-making process. What we're submitting is that a pandemic is not the time to do that, especially if we're trying really to- Isn't that exactly the time to do it when there is a serious, serious health crisis where a, an insane number of Canadians are, are dying because of this, it's global. Um, isn't this exactly the time to address it? So that we can if affect real change um, where it's needed in, in the healthcare system. Isn't this exactly the time to do it? Um, rather than wait for a time when everything is okay, isn't that a little bit a little bit Pollyanna of, of the minister to think that the best time to do to head, you know, take a take a swing at systemic racism is when everything's okay. Um, and okay for whom? I mean, there's a lot of problems with that argument um, because it says, well, just wait for, you know, these communities to be affected. And then when it's easier for us, we'll do it. Um, but in the meantime, just be satisfied with the status quo and know that we'll get to it. Um, isn't an emergency the exact time to do it? Um, I would like to draw your attention to paragraph 41 of uh, our submission. It's not so much that the that there's no time to collect race-based data, but that poor collection has implications. And uh, especially in a pandemic where data would just be taken and it wouldn't necessarily be used properly. And if the collection was done improperly, then it would have detrimental effects. That is not advancing racial justice. Okay, um, so I, I see paragraph 41 and I see it's, it's full of questions and hypotheticals, but do you have any social science evidence or anything that you're relying on in support of those theories that are in paragraph 41? Absolutely, so first of all, data can be skewed um, and that's just by the all the interconnecting factors as well, but there's also principles um, related to eugenics as well. If you just give, give me a moment, I'm just kind of, Jumping back. So the, our eugenics argument is at paragraph 37. Uh, and this gives some, a little bit more specific information. And that's that another implication is that race-based data can be used to the detriment of mar marginalized and racialized folks. Eugenics implications, for examples, where race-based data has been used to justify horrific behavior 
wouldn't that just be the instance then when someone would again come back to this court to have us adjudicate on that issue? The, the uh, abuse or the misuse of the information would also then be justiciable, right? I mean, so that doesn't prevent us from necessarily uh, allowing this appeal, does it? It, it doesn't, um, of course, an appeal could happen, but critical race theory asks us to look at other implications as well. And that includes whether we're using racialized groups as tools for learning, or if we're actually um, doing research and taking data in order to advance racial justice. Uh, it's a, so are you saying, I, I mean, I guess, are you, are you saying that the the minister is not equipped to deal with the statistical data that would be gathered? No, just that it would it would take a, a comprehensive look at the data. It would take into consideration social determinants as well, and make it, it, and taking the time to ensure that those participants are included agents in the research. Th this is the is the essential factor of critical race theory. Uh, a post racial lens is going to just look at the data and give you a demographic, but for racial data to have substance, you need to look at it with a critical race theory perspective and center race uh, as it relates to other things. So an example of this was the Tuskegee experiment where race-based data was a detriment to racial racialized pe people as uh, there was negative implications that should have been considered in this as well, but because they were not considering um, the use of black people as tools for learning, this it didn't advance racial justice. It was just demographics at play. If I go back to the eugenics argument, there's also it, in the case of black slavery where physicians such as Charles Car Caldwell used phrenology to attempt to prove that African people were in their rightful place as slaves and Nazi eugenics were modeled modeled off of this same scientific racism that justified sterilize, sterilization and the murders of millions of Jews as well. Race-based data collection in medicine has been avoided for this very reason by not, of not creating a biological basis for race. Viruses like pharmaceuticals are not race specific. Uh, our friends had mentioned about using the uh, the blue skin disease and how that relates back to specific biological elements. Whereas race is a, co a social construct, this again is a clarification that race alone is not gonna give us the information that we need. Ignoring social determinants that are intertwined with race as potential reasons for health issues is akin to suggesting that there are biological differences between socially constructed races. And there's no evidence to support this claim. So it's the minister's position that it is simply better than to do nothing than to try anything. Is that, is that accurate? No, uh, it's the minister's position, not that inaction is, uh, is perfect all the time, but that we're recognizing inaction is, uh, is a remedy to advance racial justice in this particular moment with regard to the pandemic. It's best practices that will protect the most vulnerable groups in this, in this, in this specific circumstance. Um, and to collect race-based data needs to be informed and well executed so, that, so as to not be a detriment to those races. If I could, I'd like to go back to the deference argument. And that would be again at paragraph 33. This ties directly into what I was previously saying. If black Canadians are the most at risk, this necessitates responding to health issues in a timely and thoughtful manner. Justice Martin, this directly plays to your acknowledgement of peace in the, in the national emergency doctrine. Race-based data collection is not a consideration, but epidemics are, and pan pandemics are even more severe. It's our duty to ensure that the safety of all Canadians, including Black Canadians, it is, is protected as quickly and efficiently as possible. Further, furthermore, it's reasonable to assume that expedited data collection would result in that insufficient, unusable data, 
data to the detriment of national health measures. Critical race theory asks us to at least examine what role we pay, play in perpetuating systemic racism by not evaluating issues on a case by case basis. This is not to mention that self identification is a form of compelled speech that might also be misconstrued as a condition for timely and proper treatment. Even as if a system were developed that could accurately place individuals into neat racial pockets where self-identification was no longer required, the correlation between race and health without acknowledging social determinants is weak at best. Now, if possible, I would like to jump ahead to paragraph 43. If we were to enforce race-based data collection, we should at least consider the effects of perpetuating racial prejudice, internalized racism, the use of racialized groups as tools for learning, and paternalism. Our friends submit that this consideration is a logical fallacy, but what they've done is completely discount the possible negative effects of race-based data collection. To suggest the lack of collection or races lived experience is to assume that Black and racialized identities and experiences are monolithic. They are not. As previously mentioned, critical race theory does not prescribe a singular an answer, and our submission continues to emphasize the importance of balancing these potential impacts. Risk aversion is not enough, but instead the court must take heed to minimize negative effects where possible. Race-based data collection that presents positively might suggest that certain races are affected by the virus relatively equally. This, of course, would also address social determinants along with race and any underlying relevant biological data. Contrarily, a negative interpretation of the data may perpetuate both internal and racial prejudices. As Justice Brown stated, the flip side is that race-based data collection could result in confirmation that more Black people haven't been impacted by COVID-19 and could potentially increase racial prejudice. On its face, the statement is an assumption but a deeper look identifies what the law should do, take into consideration all necessary implications, especially if an action will adversely affect the rights of vulnerable people that our charter is meant to protect. Since racism is ingrained in all facets of our lives, Justice Brown is correct in assuming that those who already hold racist tendencies will confirm their own biases with negative data or suggest that they are the authors of their own mis misfortune. Prejudice and discrimination may manifest as disrespect poor service and a failure to communicate options in healthcare. And internalized racism, racism tells us that members of racialized groups may even accept those negative assumptions and messages diminishing their own intrinsic worth. This plays in to the mistrust that racialized and vulnerable groups might have in medicine and then perpetuates the already there racial discrepancy in the healthcare system. No, but I mean, isn't, <laughs> Again, isn't the flip side, you know, the argument about paternalism, um, doesn't, doesn't your position also support a type of paternalism where you're telling a community of people who are asking that this data be collected, that you know best, that you know what their real concerns are and that you've got, you've got them covered. So isn't, isn't what is already in place a form of paternalism? The, the system, the legal system at large is, is pater, paternalism, but to govern a single group based on a, a singular person's admission or, or submission that there has been systemic racism and that it should be done is inadequate. To, to take race-based data, especially in a time of emergency, it needs to be done properly. And that's why in this particular, particular circumstance and at this time, it would not be best to do that because you have to consider the advancement of racial justice in particular. If there's possible negative effects, the data collection should be well executed, well informed, and this takes time and time would be a detriment to the most vulnerable groups in this case. In summary, the minister should be taking every measure um, and be absolutely sure that the race-based data collection is done right so that, <clears throat> excuse me, 
is done right to ensure that the health healthcare systems continue to be trusted or at least correct uh, systemic racism from previous. We don't want to perpetuate the distrust that's, that was previously mentioned. Again, race-based data collection is just the first step in comprehensive programming and the pandemic is not a time for this as it will not advance the racial justice. This is also not to mention that racialized groups should not be used as tools for learning. Again, the accurate collection protocol, protocols need to ensure that racialized participants in studies are not being used as tools, but rather as included agents. Again, this takes time and a pandemic is not the time to do that. Race-based data should, should be intentional and well thought out, especially if the court intends to enforce a positive obligation must be meaningful and must enhance the rights of the people it's trying to, to protect. So why can't that be done? Why can't that, why can't we collect that data, have that discussion um, and have people of color involved in, in, in this? What, why is that uh, impossible for the minister? It's not that it's impossible, it's just that in the time of a public emergency, it's important to consider uh, that time is going to be a detriment to people and it needs to be done the proper way. There's also other implications, uh, you know, where paternalism and race and forced race-based data um, ha has been used in Canadian history as a detriment to racialized people. And we but have- But is the real, I mean, is the real argument fr from, as I understand it, that you just don't have the time to do it properly. Is that is that really what it boils down to? Because all of those other problems I see solutions to, I don't see those as insurmountable. Um, and I see those as necessary for fighting systemic racism. Um, but is the government really just saying, look, we just don't have time and we don't, we just, we just can't get our act together on this. So don't make us do it. Is that really what it boils down to? Uh it's not, uh, it's not that inaction is always the answer, but that in a pandemic, we have to be, uh, we have to consider um, if it will advance racial justice and considering all of the negative implications that come along with it. That's why it's absolutely necessary to ensure that it's that race based data collection is done the right way. Um, an example would be the residential school system where people think that policies are uh, of a benefit to certain groups of people. Um, at the time, it was positioned as educating Indigenous peoples and helping them to assimilate, when the reality was that paternalism had detrimental effects. But isn't that, that's the point. We've learned something from the residential school debacle, and it's not the point that we can do these studies with input from the communities. Why is that not an option? It's not that it's not an option at all, but just that it needs to be done properly and um, in the best way possible that's going to advance racial justice. And because that takes time, an emergency is not the, the time to do that. It could be a detriment to, to Black people in more ways than one, Black and racialized groups in more ways than one. Um, if I could take a moment to conclude. Uh, we submit that this decision was made to protect Black and racialized Canadians using best practices in a time of emergency. Critical race theory will not prescribe a singular solution to a problem. Instead, we must consider that there are many implications to collecting race-based data, and it's reasonable that the minister took balanced potential, uh, a balanced approach to potential adverse effects as well. To defer to the minister, acknowledges that collection must be done properly and intentionally with as many resources as possible. To not enforce a positive obligation in a time of emergency ensures that black and racialized Canadians are receiving the best care at the onset. Not collecting race-based data at the time of a pandemic considers potential adverse impacts. Minimizing the potential negative effects of an action is more prudent than risking harm. Ultimately, critical race theory advances the importance of framing all possible outcomes by ensuring that racial justice is not undermined by its own actions. And that concludes our submission. Thank you, Council. All right, Justices, have no further words from the participants. Thank you all for attending the second round of the 2021 
Julius Alexander Isaac Moot. When ready, I would like to invite the Honorable Justices, Justice Martin and Justice Heredi to dismiss the appellant and respondent teams back to the main room in order to begin deliberations. After our Honorable Justices have finished with their deliberations, the appellants and the respondents will have the opportunity to return to this room to hear from our Justices. Justices, before returning to the ring, room, main room, you are welcome to remain in this private room to continue with your deliberations once uh, we have been dismissed. Thank you, uh, Council, for all of your very thoughtful and passionate and thought-provoking uh, submissions. I, I truly enjoyed hearing from all of you this morning. So thank you very much. I think you've put a lot of work and effort into these, uh, into these factums and your submissions. Thank you. Congratulations on your second round. Well done, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Justices. You're dismissed. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Okay, I see more people are joining. So I would like to remind the timekeepers to keep track of the 10 minute deliberation period so that when the judges are finished, you can go back into the room, ask them if they're done, and then the participants can rejoin the room for feedback. But yeah, any questions, I'm 